we would like to welcome Dr. Vipin Singh. Thank you so much, sir, for joining in for today's session. Now I would like to pass the stage on to you and you can begin with the session. Uh, thanks, Ayushi. I hope I'm uh, audible to you and uh, we can start with the presentation now. And uh, the talk is titled Evolution to Revolution, a perspective on 40 years of DNA sequencing. So we are into the 40th or 41st year of DNA sequencing technologies. It started way back in 1997 and then uh, 1977. And then since then, there has been a continuous evolution of the sequencing techniques. Nowadays, you have four common sequencing techniques. One is Illumina, the other is ion torrent. And then you also have what is now coming up in a big way is nanopore and pack biosequencing. So we'll talk each of these as we begin. So we start with the historical perspective and then we move on to what are these techniques and how these are being applied and how sequencing has become the new microscope. So it is commonly said that sequencing is the new microscope for everything that you need to go forward. First step is to do the sequencing, right? So we'll start with the talk now and we'll see how uh, sequencing has evolved and how it is helping us do better science and do a more comprehensive science than we had done earlier, right? So here you are. So we'll look at the basic concept in sequencing and in the historical context. Then we'll look for why there was a need for next generation sequencing techniques in 2001 will be our break point here. Then we'll talk of the contemporary sequencing techniques. We'll talk of short read and long read sequencers. We'll talk of virtual terminator sequencing. We'll talk of ion torrent, nanopore sequencing, and we'll also talk of real-time single molecule real-time sequencing. Then we'll talk of applications and data analysis steps in NGS. And remember, a next generation sequencing talk can be endless. You know, there's so much to tell that it, it can be endless. And it is a field that is very quickly evolving. So every time I give this talk, there is a new technique that is available that has to be incorporated and a previous technique that has become obsolete. So that has to be taken off here. So this is uh, how we go about. And uh, then of course, uh, there are certain prerequisites to NGS data analysis. So the students are expected to know uh, a bit of Linux environment, a bit of programming. So we'll discuss that as well, because I'm sure most of you would go into research. And if you go into research, uh, sequencing is something that you cannot avoid, right? It's like your PCR in wet lab. Sequencing data analysis is now the next thing, and uh, you will definitely would come across at some step of your research, you'll, you would have some sequencing data to analyze. So therefore, uh, some of the prerequisites that are important, we'll discuss those as well. So let's uh, look into history. This is February 2001, and if you see here, uh, this is President Bill Clinton, then the President of Americas. And uh, he uh, is basically inaugurating the event that is the launch or the basically the announcement of the completion of the human genome sequencing project. Uh, and you can see in the background, it says decoding the book of life, a milestone for humanity. And the people responsible for this are uh, these two people. This one in front is Craig Winter who formed Celera Genomics and, and uh, published a paper in science with, with, the own, with the human genome sequence. And this one here is Francis Collins. He was the leader of the Human Genome Project, the publicly funded project. And uh, this again, the paper came in Nature. So the two most uh, significant uh, journals in, in, in science uh, as such, right? So I'm sure you would have heard the name. So let's get back to the basics now. So what actually is meant by sequencing, right? So sequencing means that you are looking at the order of nucleotides in a given uh, nucleic acid molecule, right? So let me just shift this bar here. That is, uh, all right, this one is fine. I need to shift this bar. Yeah, okay. So here you are. So to so what is sequence? Sequencing is basically to uh, determine the, let me just close this as it can. So determine the order of nucleotides in a nucleic acid. Uh, you know there are four nucleotides, A, T, G, and C, and basically the order in which they appear results in a certain sort of code that can allow for uh, for coding a protein, for encoding a site where a protein can come and bind, for transcription factor binding and so on and so forth, for chromatin modification. So therefore, sequencing becomes important, right? So the question is then, uh, why do you, and um, what the, specifically the sequencing that we're looking at is what is known as the genome sequencing. What is a genome? I'm sure you would know. The genome is one full complement of genetic material in an organism or a cell. And sequencing genomes is challenging even today, and it was much more challenging when we started sequencing the human genome. And we'll come to it why it is so challenging. We'll come to it in the next few slides. So here you are. What is the, the idea of sequencing a genome? Why do you want to sequence genomes? Well, the first thing is you know that DNA is the blueprint. All of you know about the central dogma. 
So DNA is our genetic code, and then it gets transcribed into RNA, which then gets transcribed into, uh, translated into protein. Protein is the workforce. So therefore, we want to know what is there at the basal level in genetic code. Then we also want to look at how, what are the different types of variations that can exist within these species or between two species. And more importantly, the idea of sequencing the human genome was to basically try and identify variations or the changes in the sequence of between two individuals that can result in disease. So you wanted to, uh, you wanted to associate a, a certain mutation to a certain disease or certain variation to a certain disease. So therefore, uh, the major, uh, um, the major objective of sequencing the human genome was for biomedical applications. And I'll give you towards the end of the talk, I'll give an example of how that can be effective. Right. So I told you genome sequencing is complex. Why is it complex? Because, you know, most of the sequencing technologies today rely on synthesizing a complementary DNA strand using DNA polymerase. And then you basically, you know, as the nucleotides get added, you do a real-time identification of which nucleotide got added. And that allows you to basically know what is the order of nucleotides on the template strand. So here you are. Uh, the problem is that we still do not have an enzyme that can directly sequence a large piece of DNA. While there has been progress, and we'll talk of it as we move along, but we still do not have, let's say you're trying to sequence chromosome one. So there is no enzyme even today which can in vitro directly replicate chromosome one from one end to the other end. So therefore, if you want to sequence this large DNA molecule, you first have to break it into smaller pieces, right? Which are amenable to sequencing, as in when you do a complementary, uh, you know, enzyme, uh, when you do a complementary extension, uh, you should be able to reach the end of that fragment. So here you are, you break it into smaller fragments, A, B, C, D, and E, and you get the sequence of individual parts. And now the challenge is to rearrange it back in the order it is appearing in the original genome. So that is the process that is known as assembly. So if you look at a typical uh, genome assembly, a genome sequencing project, there are three main parts. One is to create a genomic library, that is to split your genomic DNA into smaller pieces. Second is to sequence these individual pieces. And then the third is to assemble them back into the original order in which they were in the genome, which is called the assembly. And this is where the major problem is. And, you know, uh, it takes time and it, it is most resource intensive. And also it is, this is the place where you can go wrong, right? So therefore, uh, genome sequencing even today is complex. Although now it has become a, a, a lot easier because we are now in the era of long range sequencers. And towards the end of the talk, I'll show you that it is only now in 2022, April 24, you have the first complete assembly of a human genome from telomere to telomere, from one end of the chromosome to the other end of the chromosome without any gaps. I'm sure you would have read that paper. It has come in April 2022, right? So here you are. So now once you have the sequence, you get it back and arrange it in the order. The, it would appear in the genome and finally get your genome sequence. You are following everyone. Yes, sir. We're following. Okay, good. Yes, sir. So then we move on and we talk more about it. Right. So here you are. Uh, this got stuck. All right. So let's talk of some basic concepts in sequencing first before we move on to sequencing technologies. So here you are. One of the concepts in sequencing is what is known as read length. So here is an image that I clicked while I was in Paris. I'm also a photographer by hobby. So this is your Eiffel Tower taken from Châtelet in Paris. A beautiful evening. So what does the challenge that I'm giving you is that I'm splitting this picture into four parts, nine parts, and 56 parts. And then you have to rearrange it together back into the original picture. So which of these would be the most difficult to rearrange? Anyone? The last one. The last one. Okay. So it is very clear because it has a lot more parts and therefore there can always be a confusion between, you know, this one and this one. These are roughly the same shade. So I could put this one here and this one here, and then it changes the composition of my picture and I do not get the exact replica of what I originally began with. Right. So in, in analogy, you can say that this is a long read sequencer where the, the, the genome that you want to sequence has been broken into larger pieces. This is an intermediate read sequencer, for example, the Sanger sequencer, nanonet base pairs. Uh, this one is, let's say, nanopore or uh, PAC bio sequencer. And this one is Illumina sequencer, where you have fragments as small as 150 bases to begin with, right? So this is uh, the concept of read length. The longer the read length, the more easy it is to assemble the genome correctly. The shorter the read length, the more the problems, right? So this is your genomic library. This is a large fragment library. This is an intermediate read library. This is your 
short read library, right? So read length, the maximum sequence length that can be obtained in one sequencing reaction. This is specific to each sequencing technique. So if you're using Illumina, you get around 150 bases. If you're using ion torrent, you get around 100 bases. If you're using uh, nanopore, you can on an average get 10 KB sequence. And uh, if you're using PAC bio again or SMRT, single molecule real-time sequencing, we'll talk of these as we go into details. Uh, again, you can get very easily 10 KB to 30 KB sequences very easily. So therefore, uh, the assembly becomes a lot easier. So read length is critical is a critical parameter for completeness and accuracy of the genome sequence, more so in repeat rate genomes. And why this is important is because if you're sequencing the human genome, then the human genome has more than 50% repeat content. So if you rely only on unique overlaps, you will not be able to assemble the genome together. And we'll talk of this in more details as we go along. So here you are. So what you do is you basically have your uh, sequences. These are your short read sequences. You put them together, align it to a reference, for example, let's say. So this is your chromosome 5. And uh, we are looking at positions on chromosome 5, position 500. And we're looking also at position chromosome 5, position 5000. So what you've done is this is your reference genome to which you're aligning your short reads, right? So there is a concept of what is known as depth or coverage in sequencing. So what is exactly the depth of coverage in sequencing? If we're looking at an individual position here, let's say we're looking at chromosome 5, position 500, then the number of reads that overlap this position here. So the, each one is 150 basis, but this position, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 reads that map to this position. So the coverage for this position is 8x. Likewise, for this position, chromosome 5, position 5,000, the coverage is 2x. And then you see there is a position here where there is no reads mapping. So this would be a gap. You will not be able to uh, have any coverage here, right? So this is uh, one good idea. One idea of uh, one basic concept in sequencing is of coverage. With next generation sequencing, you get really high coverage. With Sanger sequencing, the maximum you could get was 30x. Mostly you got was 10x. With next generation sequencing, where you can do massively parallel sequencing, you get very easily a coverage of 100x. You can go on to as much x as you want, depending on how much money you have in your project, right? So, and the other idea also is what you do is, now that you have your reads aligned up here, you can see this is overlapping with this, then this one is overlapping with this, overlaps with this, overlaps with this. So you can connect all reads that overlap with each other and form what is known as a conti till the point you get your overlap. So here you are, this is what you're doing, ah, sorry. So this is what is your conti. From here until here, you have overlapping reads. You put them together. You already have a reference, so you're not so mindful of their beats. You put them together into one conti. This region where there is no read map, you cannot extend it any further. Now you come to the second cluster of uh, reads. These are again overlapping with each other. You can put them together as a second conti. So this is your conti too, right? And in between, you have what is known as a gap. And this gap is because there is no read in your uh, library that maps to this region. Now, also, how do you increase the coverage? So coverage, if you look at the basic formula, is small n into small l. Small l is the length of the individual read that you get, individual sequence that you get. This is fixed as per the platform. I told you, Illumina will give you 150. Iron Torrent will give you 100 and uh, nanopore and pack by will give you around uh, let's say 10 kb to 30 kb capital l is the length of your genome which is also fixed depending on which organism you're looking at so the only thing you can change here is the n the more rich your library is the more repetitive your library is the higher the coverage you will get right so that is important again coverage is critical in variation and epigenetic analysis higher the coverage, the more statistical power and confidence in the analysis. So basically the idea is that the more coverage you have this position, you are more confident that the nucleotide that you've called here is actually the correct nucleotide, right? So this is one idea of coverage. Then when you assemble genomes, there is also an idea of what is known as N50, right? What is N50? So let's say you have these contigues of varying sizes in your, uh, uh, once you uh, assemble your genome, you have these, uh, so you have 100, Kilobase uh, conti, the largest one, the 70, 60, 50, 50, 40, and 30. So you arrange your contigs in decreasing order of their uh, length. And then what you're looking for is, you know the length of your assembly here, the cumulative length of your assembly is 400 kilobases. So now what you're doing is you're looking at the read length that gives you roughly, that gives you 50% of your read length. So 50% uh, of your assembly length. So if your assembly is 400 kilobases, 
you are looking for, you keep adding the length of quantiques here till the time you read, you reach a sum that is equivalent to 200 KB or more, right? So, and then the quantity that corresponds to that basically is your N50. So in this case, 100 plus 70, 170, 170 plus 60, 230. So 60 KB is your N50 value, right? So this is also an indicator of how good your assembly is. The larger the value of the N50, which means the larger the size of the quantity at N50, the more uh, correct your assembly is likely to be, the lesser the gaps are going to be, right? So that is again, uh, one of the concepts in sequencing. You're following class, everyone. Class, you're following? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Okay. That is good. Okay. So then we move on and we talk more about uh, the next concepts. So this is your N50. N50 equals to 60 here. Then we move on and we talk of, uh, so what you can also do is you could basically, once you have your library, you could have larger fragments that you could sequence only from one end or you could sequence from both ends. So this one here, what I show you, is a library that is sequenced only at one end. So let's say you're using Illumina. So this could be your 400 basis, but what you're sequencing is only 150 basis from one end, right? And then you align it to a reference genome. So you, your read here gets aligned uniquely at some places, and one of these orange reads gets aligned at two different places. So now you know that your orange read is likely to be a repeat, two or more, you know? So if it is a repeat, let's say it is coming from an ALU repeat, so ALU repeats are 1.5 million copies in the human genome. So this sequence, which is coming from an algorithm, repeat, will go to 1.5 million places in your alignment, right? So this is uh, one idea. Then, so, and what is uh, the basic thing that I'm telling you is that you have your fragment, but you've only sequenced it from one end. The other thing that you can do is you have your fragment and you could sequence it from both ends. So while the sequence is larger, 400 bases, you have the first 150 bases from one end and the other 150 bases from the other end together. And now when you read, when you align read one and read two onto the SM, onto the reference genome here, what you see is that they're separated by 700 bases. Here, they were separated by 400 bases in your uh, original genome that you have taken from. So which means that this indicates that there is a, there is a insertion in the reference genome that you do not have. And this could possibly be a repeat insertion, let's say, and I'll repeat again. Right. So this is uh, when you do a paired and uh, read sequencing, you could also identify uh, some structural variations in your genome, right, including your repeat insertion polymorphisms or small insertions or deletions. So that is also one idea in sequencing. You could do single end sequencing or you could do a paired end sequencing. And these may again be helpful in assembly. Now we come to assembly complications when you have repeat end. So for example, here, the red one is a repeat end, right? So what you do is, you have your repeats, uh, you have your sequences here. These are individual reads, A, B, C, D, and E. So you have, when you compare the three prime end of A, you have a unique overlap with three, five prime end of C. So you know, C follows A. Now when you compare the three prime end of C, it has the same match with the five prime end of B, with the five prime end of E, with the five prime end of F. So now you are stuck. You're not sure which of these fragments is next to C. So this is uh, one major problem with short reads where you cannot really uh, very comfortably do a de novo sequencing. And therefore, most of the times when you have a short read, you do a reference-based assembly. With long read sequencers, there is an advantage that you, because you have long reads, some of these reads would span over the repeat end and have a unique end. That would allow you to assemble them de novo without the need of a reference, right? So that is, uh, again, some something that is advantageous with long read sequencers. So here we are, we are talking of these. So we are talking of Sanger sequencer. Then this is the Illumina, the original version, right? Then you have the ion torrent machine. Then you have nanopore and you can see the size comparison. Nanopore is mostly of size of a large pen drive, right? And it could be held in hand. And that is the, the plus or, or advantage with nanopore. We'll talk of it in more details as we go along. Then you have the Promethan. This is the multiple assembly of nanopores. And then this is your pack biosequencer. So this is the evolution of sequencing techniques we're talking about. 